Our next speaker is Sasha Lang, and he'll talk about spontaneous Ginsburg excitations of a superluminal under the wave detector in a dispersive and dissipative medium. So please, Sasha, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thanks a lot for um, organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to present this work, which was done together with my PhD advisor, Ralf Schützold, in collaboration with Bill Anru and with our experimental colleague, Roland Sauerbrei. And I want to start with a brief recap on some known results regarding the excitation probabilities of moving unreal DV detectors, which are initially in their quantum mechanical ground state. And when talking about unreal DV detectors today, I always have a point like two level system in mind, which moves along some prescribed classical trajectory. And later on, we will consider a scenario where such an unreal DV detector is realized by means of a hydrogen atom. And there are quite famous results for particle detectors moving through a relativistic one plus one dimensional scalar field in its quantum mechanical ground state. It is known that particle detectors in inertial motion do not have a chance to get excited, so they won't click. The situation is different for accelerated detectors, for example, for detectors on uniformly accelerated paths, they have a chance to click. And regarding inertial motion, there is one hypothetical exceptional case to be mentioned. In principle, if one was able to realize a superluminal particle detector, this would have a finite chance to get spontaneously excited. And this leads to the question, what happens to superluminal detectors which move in dielectric media? in which there's a reduced effective speed of light as compared to the speed of light associated with the ordinary um, light cone in vacuum. In such scenarios, it should be principle, at least in, possible at least in principle, to realize particle detectors which move at velocities which are greater than the medium speed of light but below the vacuum velocity. Those particle detectors turn out to have a small chance to get spontaneously excited. And the question is, why is that? Well, let's consider the situation from the perspective of such a moving detector. If you have such a moving detector, this detector perceives the surrounding field modes to be Lorentz boosted in energy. And it perceives this boosted energy here. And if the velocity of the detector exceeds the phase velocity in the medium, then those energies associated with surrounding photons are negative. And then creating a photon in such a negative energy mode sets free an energy, and this energy can be used to excite the atom. The mechanism is sometimes called the Ginsburg effect. Um, and by Ginsburg itself, himself, it was called the anomalous Doppler effect. So it's actually related to what was mentioned before that um, today. Um, this Ginsburg effect has been studied before, but we will consider the situation of a superluminal atom or particle detector moving in a dispersive medium. And as a dispersive medium, we will consider a toy model, which is called the Hopfield model. And in its simplest version, it yields a dispersive re dispersion relation of the form given here. We have two discrete energy bands, omega minus and omega plus. And they are separated by a band gap just above the resonance frequency omega of the medium. For small energies, the lower energy band is approximately linear. At larger wave numbers, this flattens out. And each wave number for a photon in such a Hopfield dielectric has its own characteristic medium speed of light, so its own characteristic light cone. And assuming an inertial detector, which moves at a fixed velocity, this picture suggests that it should always be possible to find a field mode which has an even slower propagation speed. And this can be accomplished by going even closer to the medium resonance, because for very large wave numbers, where the slower band grows close to resonance, the phase velocity drops to zero. So this could suggest that arbitrarily slow detectors always have some chance to get spontaneously excited, and we want to investigate whether that's indeed the case. 
And as already mentioned, such excitation processes would involve those slow field modes close to resonance. And in realistic media, one has to include dispersion and dissipation, so material properties in this parameter regime. And that's why I first want to briefly introduce a model for a dispersive and dissipative medium I worked on previously. We will envision a medium which is one plus one dimensional and lives on the x-axis of some coordinate frame. And we assume, just for simplicity, the electric and magnetic fields inside this medium to be fixed in orientation, so we just take a single polarization direction of the field into account. Under this assumption, those fields can be described by a scalar vector potential A of t and x, and we are going to write down a system Lagrangian in the first step. And this first line here accounts for the energy contributions associated with the electric field and with the magnetic field. We then add polarization or um, dispersion by including polarization effects in the medium. And we do this by attaching harmonic oscillators psi to all points x of the medium. And we name their resonance frequency capital omega. And we couple those oscillators to the electric field in a dipole approximation with coupling strength little g. The model so far has been known for decades and is this famous Hopfield model, which yields the dispersion relation I had on the previous slide. And we added dissipation to this initially non dissipative model by turning all those medium oscillators into damped oscillators. And we achieved this by coupling them to a scalar environment field phi, which we allow to propagate in some perpendicular psi direction, and this field can carry away energy and information. Um, by assuming this field to propagate in psi direction only, we assume that this field has an anisotropic dispersion relation, but apart from that, it's just a two plus one dimensional scalar field, and we couple this field in a dipole approximation once again, um, to the medium polarization, so to the medium oscillators, and name the dissipation strength capital G. And this Lagrangian can be used to derive a consistent quantum mechanical treatment via canonical quantization, and one can then work out Heisenberg equations of motion, and they have surprisingly simple solutions. I just want to give you a brief idea on how this works. And therefore, we will consider the equation of motion for the environment field. This field or based this driven wave equation here, which has a source term involving the medium polarization. And the solution of this equation consists of two terms. We have one term here, which is a particular retarded solution of this full inhomogeneous wave equation. And we have a second contribution phi zero, which is the general solution of the corresponding homogeneous problem. And this phi zero solution is basically a plane wave contribution to the field and can be interpreted as some incoming contribution to the field, which approaches the medium along the environmental direction psi and enters from this spatial infinity and has not interacted with the medium yet. And the remaining contribution is basically the scattering term contributing to this field. Using this formal solution, it's possible to decouple the remaining equations of motion for the quantum field operators, and it's then possible to derive a relatively simple solution for the vector potential. Although at first glance, this might look a bit messy, it's actually pretty straightforward in structure. We integrate over wave numbers in x direction and have a second integration variable kappa, whose absolute value corresponds to the frequency of the respective field contribution here. We have operator valued coefficients. Those BK kappas constitute the annihilation operators of incoming phi zero photons, which are incident on the medium from the environmental coordinates direction. And we have a relatively messy, but not too complicated prefactor. And it's possible to write down similar expressions also for the medium polarization field and for the environment field. And eventually, we can use those solutions to express the Hamiltonian of our model in terms of the annihilation and corresponding creation operators of those phi zero photons. And it turns out that those operators diagonalize the system Hamiltonian, which is quite convenient. And the energy eigenvalues rather unsurprisingly correspond to the frequencies of the associated um, modes.
in the vector potential. And that's all we need to know about the model for the moment. And we can now use this model to study the response of an inertial two-level particle detector moving at a constant velocity through a medium. This detector will later be realized with a hydrogen atom and we assume it to be initially in some ground state and we're interested in excitation probabilities to a higher lying state with an energy gap delta omega. We describe this full system via a Hamiltonian which is formulated in the rest frame of this moving atom or particle detector. The first term here just accounts for this detector's contribution. We have its energy eigenvalues and the projectors onto the corresponding eigenstates. The second term is basically just the Hamiltonian of the surrounding dispersive and dissipative field. Compared with the Hamiltonian from the previous slide, where we had energy eigenvalues absolute value of kappa, we now don't have the eigenenergies as seen by a laboratory frame observer, but have the Lorentz boosted energies as perceived by the moving detector. And we couple the detector's atomic dipole moment evaluated at the proper time of this detector to the electric field as seen by the detector along its world line at its proper time. So as usual, and I named this field E tilde henceforth, and it can be calculated by differentiating the vector potential along the world line of the particle with respect to the proper time. And within this model, it's possible to use the established procedure for calculating an excitation probability. And as usual in the treatment of unruh type detectors, the excitation probability per time scales or is proportional to the Fourier transform of the two-point correlation of the field seen by the detector. And this temporal Fourier transform is to be evaluated at the detector's energy gap delta omega divided by a gamma factor. The electric field term here involves factors which are time harmonic functions. The same kind of function occurs here. We integrate over all times. So this integral will yield a Dirac delta function. And this Dirac delta imposes conservation of energy in the rest frame of our moving detector. It peaks whenever the detector's energy gap up to a sign matches the Lorentz boosted energy of one of the surrounding field modes. And since delta omega is positive, this condition can only be met for surrounding field modes whose phase velocities, absolute value kappa over k, are smaller than the absolute value of the atom speed. And this basically indicates that indeed those excitations which can occur rely on quantum vacuum fluctuations of the surrounding field which move more slowly than the detector. Apart from this Dirac delta, there's another factor occurring in the two-point function uh, in this excitation probability. I just abbreviated this because it looks a bit messy and um, just want to stress that this term is always positive. So if this term is always positive and this Dirac delta function always peaks somewhere, this suggests that the excitation probability should be non-zero for arbitrary atom speeds, so for arbitrarily slow detectors and for arbitrary dissipation strengths. But this observation is a bit surprising because apparently one would expect someone should have seen this kind of effect if it extended to arbitrarily slow detectors. And that's why we had a closer look at this term and that's why I put it up once more here, and we are reconsidering this expression for a weakly dissipative medium with a relatively small dissipation strength. Whenever the dissipation strength is small, this prefactor here notably differs from zero only if the absolute value of kappa approximately matches one of those non-dissipative Hopfield energies from this dispersion relation I started with on my motivation slide. And if this condition is met, then the delta function peaks approximately where one of those energy bands intersects this expression here. And this expression um, corresponds to this blue line and has a slope which represents or reflects the atom's velocity. And for arbitrarily slow velocities, so for arbitrarily slow 
small slopes, there's always a point of intersection somewhere. But for very slow detectors, this point of intersection moves to very large wave numbers. And here one has to be careful because at some point, the continuum limit approximation of our model will break down. So in a realistic medium, there are no infinitely large wave numbers close to the medium resonance. And this could lead to artifacts. And to avoid such artifacts, we truncated the wave number integral at a suitable cutoff k max. If we do so, it's clear that this point of intersection occurs below the cutoff only if the atom has a certain minimum velocity. So in fact, this Ginzburg effect does not extend to arbitrarily slow atoms. And one also has to take into account that a real beam of atoms would not be sent right through a dielectric bulk medium, but one would rather need to drill a hole through a crystal and send a beam of atoms through this hole. In this scenario, the atoms would not directly see the field modes in a bulk dielectric, but would rather see evanescent fields which leak from the crystal into the hole, and those modes fall off on relatively short length scales, so the atoms need to move very close to the surface to get excited. But we did an order of magnitude estimate where we envisioned a beam of hydrogen atoms in the 2s state, which is meter stable, to pass through a hole in a block of silicon, and we found that spontaneous Ginzburg excitations should be feasible if the atoms have roughly a quarter of the speed of light and atom surface separations of roughly nine nanometers. Meeting those requirements experimentally is definitely challenging, but should not be out of reach. And that's actually quite promising. So let me conclude with a few take home messages. We considered a scenario where Inertial atoms move through a dispersive medium and ask whether they can undergo spontaneous Ginzburg excitations. This question was inspired by the observation that close to medium resonances, phase velocities of quantum fluctuations grow relatively small, so might be smaller than atom speeds. In this parameter regime, dispersion and dissipation play a role. Therefore, I introduced a model for those properties. And we were then able to study inertial atoms moving through dispersive and dissipative dielectrics. We found that indeed those atoms can perceive Lorentz boosted energies, which may grow negative, which could give rise to Ginzburg excitations. But in realistic media with a wave number cutoff, a certain minimum velocity has to be reached. And in a real experiment, this minimum velocity is on the order of a quarter of the speed of light, which makes such an experiment very challenging but potentially feasible. And with that, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks a lot for, for the talk. Uh, I guess we already have a question from, from Morgan. So please, Morgan, go ahead. Um, yeah, so this is really cool stuff, actually. Um, I guess the first question is, is there an effective temperature? Like when you, you, know, you take the ratio of excitations to de-excitations and take the log of it, and you can get some effective temperature from that. Is there is there a temperature that you guys are looking for? Or what would, a, what would the... That 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 you know that that logarithm thing looked like for you guys. Um, we haven't looked at the temperature because we consider a scenario. Um, well, anyway, the response would be really small. So we consider a scenario where we start with a very large beam of atoms, and just a tiny fraction of atoms sent through a hole will move close enough to the surface mm -hmm. to have a chance to get excited, and then we would expect to obtain spontaneous excitations if we start with a very large um, particle accelerator at the beginning to produce a beam of sufficiently fast atoms. Um, we would expect excitation events to occur on the order of every couple of minutes. Okay. So it would rather be an experiment where you try to see individual excitations. I see. And then okay, so these, these are neutral atoms, right? And then I, I didn't see. I see the delta function for the conservation of energy. And normally in the in Cherenkov radiation, you you get the Cherenkov cone from that condition. Is there is there a cone that you get from these things, or is it just is it emitted in all directions? Um, well, the calculation I presented today was a one-dimensional toy model, ah, okay. um, and we included the three-dimensional esti or the three-dimensional estimates presented here um, rely on order of magnitude estimates which are still a relatively simplified model. But of course, there you get some angular contributions. Um, but in principle, 
the main contribution to this effect is of quantum vacuum fluctuations, which our detector overtakes. So I think if I remember correctly, the main contribution is from the, from this particular parameter regime here. But that's a question that should be investigated more closely um, in a more realistic model. Okay, and these are these are these are starting off in their ground state or the metastable state, right? So they're they're okay. And so you're looking for actual excitations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really. And then cool. by realizing a sufficiently long particle detector, um, one should be able to see the excited atoms to decay back to their ground state. And so um, this should go ahead, go ahead. should occur on some length scale. I think something like on the order of meter. Or something like that. So afterwards, the excited atoms should decay to the ground state, and we would be looking for the light emitted by this de excitation. And I, I guess one final question, I guess, is because you, you had mentioned that there's you're working with an experimentalist. Are you guys actually building? I mean, is this an experiment that's in house over there in Dresden or wherever you guys are? Or are um, you no, you really need a very large accelerator to produce a beam of atoms. So you start with protons from a large accelerator, and there you would need one of the pre-accelerators of those very large scale facilities. So um, this experimental collaboration mainly intended to assessing, well, is this actually feasible in principle, but not um, aiming at a direct realization in the far future. Okay. In the, no, in the soon future, sorry. <laughs> um cool i guess that's yeah really interesting stuff actually i like it thank you very much so uh thank thanks for the the question thanks for the the answer session so let's thank you again